Okay, let us move on with our high symmetry point groups. So in the last class, we've already um, seen that we have uh, two tetrahedral high symmetry point groups, that's the point group GD and the point group T. And then we already discussed already the octahedral point group um, OH, and we've seen that the octahedral point was quite a few um, symmetry elements uh, and symmetry operations already. So we have the identity, we have the inversion center, we have four S6 axes, um, we have four <coughs> C3 um, rotational axes, we have three S4, <coughs> we have three C4, so the C4s are our principal axes, then we have six C2s, three um, C2 um, um, primes, um, yeah, it's actually the prime missing, three sigma H's and six uh, sigma D's. So these are all quite a few um, symmetry elements. So there's one more, um, or actually two more high symmetry point groups that are associated with the Hitler symmetry. So the first one is, Um, the rotational subgroup um, O. So like in the rotational subgroup T, um, all elements of the um, uh, point group OH are present, um, except those that are not the identity or um, proper rotations. So um, you see, this illustrated here. So these are again all the symmetry elements associated with the point OH. And now in the rotational subgroup, um, those that are not proper rotations and which are not the identity are omitted. So the inversion is gone, um, the S6 are gone, the S4 are gone, and the mirror planes are also gone. And that leaves the identity 4C3. 3C4 and uh, 6C2, okay? And the associated operations with these symmetry elements change. Um, accordingly, so the inversion operation is gone, the S6 operations, the S4 operations, as well as the um, sigma H and the, and the sigma D um, operations. Um, so the rotational subgroup O is relatively uh, rare, but a few examples exist. And you see actually one example here. So this is the core of a uh, polyoxo um, metalate, uh, a vanadate uh, to be precise. So this core consists of six vanadiums, eight phosphorus atoms, and um, um, 24 um, oxygen atoms here, and you see here the structure of the, uh, of the uh, cluster. Okay. Um, so you see here the symmetry elements that are left, the C4s, which are still standing here. Um, the third one is here, then we have the C3s still present, and we have the C2 symmetry elements present here as well. Okay, now we can rotate, for instance, around the C4, and you see that the um, um, cluster superimposes. We can rotate around the C3, okay, and you see that the cluster imposes, superimposes, and we can do finally the same also for the C2, and we can see that the cluster super in poses. Okay, but besides these symmetry elements, uh, there's no other symmetry element uh, besides the identity. Okay, so now related to that, there's a point group which is called TH, which is also derived from the octahedral point group OH. So it is 
all symmetry elements and all symmetry operations of OH except some which are uh, taken, taken out. Uh, so you see here an example um, of a molecule which is derived uh, or which belongs to the, the, the point group TH and is derived from an octahedron. Um, so this is um, um, iron hexapyridyl um, to plus. So you see it has here an iron in the center. And this iron is coordinated by six pyridyl ligands in an octahedral fashion. Okay. So counting only the coordinating nitrogen atoms here, we would have, well, our iron ideally octahedrally coordinated, and the point would be OH, but because of the planar nature of the pyridyl ligand, the symmetry is being reduced from um, OH to TH. So um, the C4 axis, um, which would stand usually here, for an instance, is no longer there because of the planarity of the ligand, but the associated C2 um, axis is um, still there. You can also see that the sigma H uh, mirror plane um, still exists, while the sigma D mirror planes do not exist anymore. So um, we can rotate, for instance, around the C2 axis, and you see that the molecule is superimposing. We can also um, mirror at the horizontal mirror plane that stands to the C2 axis, which is now our principal axis. So in addition to that, we also have a C3 axis still, which stands um, here. Um, so as we rotate around uh, this um, axis, as you can see here, our molecule superimposes again. And um, last but not least, we also have an S6 axis, which stands uh, in the same position as uh, the, the C3 axis. And um, when we carry out this symmetry element, then we have to rotate by 60 degrees first, and then mirror perpendicular, and we see that our molecule superimposes as well. All right. So um, now overall, we have... Um, um, the um, identity, we have um, our inversion center, which is still there. We have the S6, the C3, um, the uh, 3C2, and the sigma H. But the sigma D um, are eliminated, the uh, S4 are eliminated, um, the C4 are eliminated, and um, the um, um, six to uh, six C two prime um, axes are also um, eliminated. Okay, so overall we have as the operations the inversion operation eight uh, S six uh, operations coming from uh, these four S six improper rotational axes. Then we have eight C3 operations associated with these four um, C3s. We have three C2 operations associated with these three C2s. And we have three Sigma H operations associated with um, these three um, Sigma H mirror planes. Okay, so now we are basically done with the octahedral symmetry. So last but not least, we need to consider the icosahedral symmetry. And we will see that the icosahedral symmetry is the symmetry with the greatest number of symmetry elements and symmetry operations. Overall, we will have 120 symmetry operations to consider. Um, so the icosahedral symmetry is associated with two different um, platonic solids, that's the icosahedron itself, but it's also the dodecahedron. Just as a reminder, the icosahedron is being made of 20 triangles, regular triangles, whereas the dodecahedron is made of um, 12 pentagons. You see uh, one pentagon here, 
You see in the background, there's another Pentagon, which is in, uh, it's standing, I'm staggered, relative to the other Pentagon. Okay. And you see here, there are five more Pentagons in the foreground, this one here, okay. Then this one here, this one here, this one here, and this one here, okay. And then there are more pentagons in the background, okay. <coughs> so this is this one here, and these are another five. And this one here, this pentagon here, that pentagon here, and that pentagon here, and that pentagon here, okay. So that gives five plus five plus two gives 12. Okay, um, so um, an example of a dodecahedral molecule is the dodecahedrane. Uh, you see that um, here in this case, the carbon atoms, they occupy the corners of such a dodecahedron. So you have overall, well, um, um, how many carbon atoms? Well, that's these five here in the foreground, then the other five here in the background. Okay, so that's uh, 10. Okay, and in addition to that, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 um, carbon. Um, atoms in addition, so that will give overall 20, okay? And, um, well, each carbon atom is then um, attached to one hydrogen atom, so we have as many hydrogen atoms. As carbon atoms, the formula would be C20H20. Okay, uh, then, in contrast to that, we have here the icosahedron. Let's um, try to understand the icosahedron um, a little bit better. So the icosahedron, we will see this in more detail in a minute, um, uh, is uh, also having a pentagonal symmetry. So in the case of the dodecahedron, this is very easy to see because of made, it's made of pentagons, but it's not so easy to see in the icosahedron. The icosahedron, you have pentagons made of five triangles, okay? So you have here this pentagon in the foreground. Okay, and this pentagon is made of five triangles. This is this triangle, and this triangle, and this triangle, and this triangle, okay? So this point here caps the base of this pentagon here, okay? And then you have another pentagon in the background, which stands in a staggered conformation relative to the first pentagon. So this is this one here. Okay. And this uh, pentagon is also capped, okay, by a point which is now in the background. And again, you have here these one two, three, four, and five um, triangles, okay? So now that gives overall five plus five is 10. And there are 10 other triangles, basically, that interconnect um, these two um, pentagons, okay? And that gives then the overall icosahedron. So there are also uh, molecules with icosahedral symmetry. Here you have an example of a molecular anine, B2, uh, B12, H12, uh, two minus. So in this molecule here, you have the boron atoms that occupy the corners of our icosahedron. And each boron atom is uh, capped with a hydrogen atom and the overall anion has a two minus charge. So to determine the symmetry elements and symmetry operations within the icosahedral point group IH, we could either use the dodecahedron 
or the icosahedron that would lead us to the identical result. So um, by arbitrary choice, let us uh, focus here on the icosahedron. Okay, so as I said previously, um, the icosahedron has pentagonal symmetry. So it has C5 axes as the principal axis, okay? And because we have a high symmetry point group here, we have multiple of these C5 axes. So you see one here, which goes to two opposite um, corners of the icosahedron, okay? So um, we can ask, well, how many of these C2 axes would we expect? Now you can see from this picture that we have two um, axes, uh, sorry, uh, two corners per C5 axis. And now remember the icosahedron is a, plat a platonic solid. So all of these um, vertices, they must be symmetry equivalent. So in order to determine the number of C5 axes, we would need to count the number of corners and divide that number by two, and then we'd have the number of C2 axes. So let us count them. Uh, we have this corner here, and then we have the other corner on the opposite side. So that's two, okay? And then we have uh, these, these, these five corners here, okay? These five corners make up the pentagon, which is in the foreground. Okay. And then we have these other five corners here that make up the pentagon in the background. And so on. So that's overall five plus five plus two, so that's 12. So that's, um, that's 12 corners. Now, if you have 12 divided by two, then that gives, well, six. Okay. So we have six uh, C5 axes that go through opposite uh, vertices within the icosahedron. Okay, so now we have found our principal axes. Let us see if we can find also symmetry elements that have a uh, lower order. But before we go to that, we still need to decide how many symmetry operations are associated with these C5, um, C5 axes. So basically we need to consider everything between every operation between the C5-1 um, and the C5-5, but the C5-5 is already accounted for by the identity. So we only need to consider the C5-1 the C52, the C53, and the C54. Okay, so that means that we have four symmetry operations per symmetry element. So that means that we have six times four, giving overall 24 symmetry operations. Okay, so six of them are C51, another six of them are C52, another uh, six of them are C53. Um, and another six of them are C54, okay? But now let's really look at what other uh, proper rotational um, axes are there. So those with the next higher um, order are the C3 um, rotations. So we see here, one of the C3s um, going through the icosahedron. So you see that a C3 goes through a center of a triangular face and it enters through the center of a triangular face and it also leaves through the center of a triangular face where by the two triangular faces uh, are uh, parallel to each other. See that this one is parallel to this one whereby <coughs> Excuse me. This one here is uh, 
well, in, in, in staggered orientation relative to this one here. So it's uh, rotated 60 degrees uh, relative to this one here. Okay, so now how many of these do we have? Um, so now in order to determine this, we have to determine the number of faces and then divide the number of faces by two. And that gives us the number of C3 axes. Okay, this is because we have one C3 per two triangular faces. So now the icosahedron is called icosahedron because it has 20 triangular faces. And so we have uh, 20 over 2 is equal to uh, uh, 10 C3 axes. You see here all the 10 C3 axes going to the centers of the 20 triangular faces. So now how many symmetry operations are associated with these uh, um, 10 uh, C3 axes? Well, for each of them, we have to consider C31, C32, and C33. But C33 is already the identity. So we only consider C31 and C32. So that's two symmetry operations per symmetry element. So we have 10 symmetry elements. So we have 10 times two is equal to 20 symmetry operations. Okay, 10 of them are C31 and the other 10 of them are C32. Okay, now in addition to that, we also have C2 uh, proper rotations. And you see one of uh, the C2 proper rotations here. So let's analyze where it goes exactly. And you see that it actually um, um, cuts through um, this edge here in the middle and it leaves the polyhedron here through another edge on the opposite side. So that means that we have uh, two, uh, <clears throat> two um, edges per C2. So that means that in order to determine the number of C2 axes in the icosahedron, we have to count the number of edges, divide that and divide that by so now how many edges do we have? Um, let's just count them. But we have um, these five here on the front. Okay. And then we have these five here, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so that gives all the 10. So then um, we have basically the same on the other side of the octahedron, uh, of the icosahedron, okay? Because we have another cap pentagon on the other side of the icosahedron pointing to the back. So these are basically these five, one, two, three, four, five, and these five, one, two, three, four, five. Okay, so now we have 20, but these are still not all of them. Um, we have actually another 10 that basically interconnect um, the Pentagon that points toward us and the Pentagon, which is in the background. Okay, so these are these ones. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. So that's another 10. So we overall have 30. So now 30 over two, well, that gives us 15. And you see here all the 15 C2 axes. So how many symmetry operations are associated with these 15 C2 symmetry elements? So in principle, we have to consider 
the C21 and the C22, but the C22 is the same as the identity, so we only consider the C21. So that means that we have 15 um, symmetry um, operations associated with the symmetry element. So this prime is actually incorrect. Uh, we have only one type of C2 symmetry operation. So all the 15 um, C2 axes are conjugate um, relative to each other. Okay, so now what else? Um, we have also mirror planes, and you see one mirror plane here. Okay, so now you see that um, such a mirror plane contains uh, two opposite edges, this one here and this one here. Okay, it contains no other edge. So therefore, how many of these mirror planes will we have? Well, we will have as many mirror planes as we will have edges divided by two. So we just counted the edges. They were 30. And therefore, we will have 30 divided by two is equal to 15 mirror planes. So here you see all the 15 mirror planes of our icosahedron. So how many operations where we have associated with the mirror plane. So we know that there's only one operation associated with the mirror plane. We will have also 15 reflection operations. So what else? Well, we also have an inversion center to consider, which sits just in the center of our icosahedron. Okay, and we can move every point um, of the icosahedron through that inversion center to the other side, and then our object will superimpose. If only one symmetry operation associated with each inversion center, so the number of symmetry operations will be the same as the number of symmetry elements, which will be just one. So what else is still to consider? Well, we still have um, rotational reflections to consider. So the rotational reflection um, with the highest order is the S10 um, rotational reflection. So we have S10 improper rotational axes that stand exactly where the C5 proper rotational axes stood, namely, they go through two opposite um, vertices of our icosahedron. You can see one um, improper rotational axis here. You see the associated mirror plane is here. The mirror plane stands perpendicular to the S10. Okay. So now, why does the symmetry operation work? It works because um, we have. Here, this pentagonal um, well, this pentagon here, and we have this pentagon here, okay? And the S10 axis goes to the center of both pentagons, the top one and the bottom one, okay? But you also see that these pentagons, they are standing um, in a staggered orientation <clears throat> relative to each other. And that makes it, makes it possible that we can rotate just by 36 degrees, okay? And then mirror perpendicular and make the polyhedron superimpose, okay? So for instance, you can put yourself on this uh, corner here, rotate by 36 degrees, mirror perpendicular, and then your uh, point will superimpose this point over there, and all other points will behave um, analogously. 
So now, how many of these uh, S10 rotation reflections will we have? Um, now again, um, we realize that one S10 goes to two opposite vertices. So that means that the number of S10s are just the number of vertices divided by two. So we previously determined that we have um, overall 12 vertices. So therefore we have 12 divided by two is equal to six of these S10s. So now how many symmetry operations are associated with these S10s? So 10 um, is an even number. So that means that we would need to consider all symmetry operations from S1 to S10. So we already know that the S1010 is the same as the identity. But are there also other symmetry operations that can be expressed by simpler symmetry operations? And the answer is, um, the answer is yes. So only the S1001, the S1003, the S1007, and the S109 are independent and unique symmetry operations. So the S102 is the same as a C51. And this is because um, when we have an S102, then we have to rotate two times around 36 degrees, which is the same as rotating around 72 degrees. And we have to reflect two times. And so that's the same as not um, reflecting at all. So effectively, we only rotate by 72 degrees, and this is the same as a C51. Okay. Similarly, when we have an S104, <coughs> then that is the same as a C52, because we rotate two times around 72 degrees. Okay. And we do not reflect at all because reflecting four times is the same as not reflecting at all. So effectively, we only rotate by two times uh, 72 degrees, which is equal to uh, uh, 144 degrees. So then um, the S105 is the same as the inversion. And uh, one could show that. Um, which I do not hear, do here explicitly. Um, then the S106 uh, is the same as, the, uh, as uh, the C53. Again, we can understand this because reflecting an even number of times is not like, is, is, is just like reflecting, is like not reflecting at all. So we actually only rotate um, six times by 36 degrees which is the same as rotating three times by um, uh, twice the angle. And finally, the S108 is the same as the C58 for essentially the same reason. Again, we are reflecting even number of times. That's uh, just like not reflecting um, at all and uh, rotating eight times around 36 degrees is uh, the same as um, rotating only four times. Actually, this is a typo here. This has to be C54. Um, rotating only uh, four times uh, around 72 degrees. OK, um, now is there anything else left? And the answer is. Yes, we are still not done. Um, in addition to the S10 improper rotation reflections, we also have S6 improper rotation reflections. So the S6 improper rotational axes stand exactly where the C3 improper rotational axes stood. Namely, they go to the centers of two opposite triangular faces of the icosahedron. 
Okay. So now how many of the S6 um, improper rotational axes do we have? Well, this should be again uh, the number of phases divided by two. So how many phases do we have? We have overall 20 phases because we can even divided by two, well, that gives 10. And here um, we see all the um, triangular, uh, sorry, the S6 um, uh, improper, improper rotation reflection. So now how many um, symmetry operations are associated with this? So again, the order is even, so we have to consider everything between S61 to S65. Uh, sorry, S66, but S66 is the identity. So that leaves everything between um, S61 and S65. So are they all unique? The answer is um, no. Um, only the S61 is unique and the S65 is unique. So the S62 is the same as the C31, because again, reflecting uh, two times is like not reflecting at all because two is an even number. So rotating two times around 100, as uh, sorry, two times 60 degrees is the same as rotating only one time by 120 degrees. Um, so the S63 is the same as the inversion, and one could show this uh, also again, um, with a little bit more effort, one could also detail this, I'm not doing this here. Um, and the S64 is the same as the um, C32, that's again because reflecting four times is the same as not reflecting at all, and rota rotating four times around 60 degrees is the same as rotating two times around 120 degrees. Okay, so um, that is finally it. You see that the icosahedral point group IH has really quite a lot of symmetry elements and a lot of symmetry operations. Um, so they are just uh, summarized here. Um, so we have the identity and never forget that. Um, also, when you list symmetry elements in order not to lose points, you have the 65s, we have 10 C3s, we have 15 C2s, we have 15 sigmas, the inversion center, six sigma tens, and 10, uh, uh, sorry, six S tens and 10 S six. Okay, so that gives overall the identity operation. 24 C5 operations, 20 C3 operations, 30 C2 operations, 15 Sigma operations, one inversion operation, 24 S10 operations, and 20 S6 operations. So overall, we have 120 symmetry operations here. So this gives the uh, order of 120, which is the highest uh, order of all point groups. So now are we completely finished? The answer is uh, no, we are not quite finished because there's also a rotational subgroup to the icosahedral point group IH and it is called just um, I. So um, like in the previous rotational subgroups, um, we have all symmetry elements and all symmetry operations of the high symmetry point group, um, except that those which are not um, the identity and proper rotations are eliminated. So what does that mean for the subgroup I? Uh, that means that the 15 Mirror planes are getting eliminated. The inversion gets eliminated. The S10 operations get eliminated. And the X6 operations get eliminated. 
So that still leaves the identity, the six uh, C5, the 10 C3s, and the 15 C2s. And associated symmetry operations. So this uh, um, um, subgroup I is uh, uh, relatively rare, but there are uh, some examples. So one example is uh, so-called SNAP dodecahedron, as shown here. And uh, you can see that it is made of pentagonal and triangular faces, whereby each pentagonal face, such as this one here, is surrounded by uh, triangular faces. Okay. And um, in fact, each of these uh, pentagons here is surrounded by um, 10 um, triangular faces. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Oh, no, I'm sorry, it's 15, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay. So um, <clears throat> now we are finished with our rotational, uh, sorry, with our high symmetry point groups. And we have still a little bit of time to discuss Now the point groups, which are in between low symmetry and high symmetry point groups. So first we consider point groups that have only one uh, proper um, n-fold axis. So these are called rotational groups. Okay, note that these are this is not the same as a rotational subgroup, which we, just, which we discussed previously. So please distinguish between a rotational group and a rotational subgroup. Um, so um, in this case, you have basically uh, one n-fold axis in addition to the um, identity. Um, optionally, you have also more symmetry elements, but um, no other um, axes. So one example is the um, hydrogen peroxide molecule, H2O2. Um, you see here the two oxygen atoms and here the two hydrogen atoms. So the a hydrogen peroxide molecule with the so-called so -called roof structure, which makes that molecule non-planar because the electron lone pairs at the oxygen consume more space than the hydrogens. So they try to get the greatest distance from each other, which forces the hydrogens also to um, adopt the greatest distance from each other so that one hydrogen here points to the back and the other hydrogen here points to the front. So that produces this C2 <clears throat> axis here. But other than this C2 axis, there's no other symmetry element uh, but the identity. So this makes this molecule belong to the point group C um, two, okay, which is one example of the uh, cyclic uh, groups uh, CN. So th they have uh, uh, one rotational axis only, but no other symmetry elements such as mirror planes. Okay, so now. Um, in addition, we know the so-called uh, pyramidal groups, which is another subclass of the rotational groups. So in this case, we have the point group symbol C, N, V, whereby N again indicates the order of the principal axis. 
But then in addition to the principal axis, we have now n vertical mirror planes. So for instance, uh, when the order of the principal axis is three, then that means that we have three additional vertical mirror planes. When the principal axis has the order four, we know that we have four vertical uh, mirror planes. So an example is the um, molecule uh, NH3, um, which belongs to the point group uh, C3V. In this case, we have uh, uh, um, trigonal um, pyramid. Um, and we have the C3 axis going through the top of the pyramid. And you see here we have uh, three vertical mirror planes in addition to that C3 axis. So generally, um, molecules from the point of C and V are derived from an engonal pyramid. So the NH3 molecule would be derived from a trigonal pyramid um, if we increase uh, the number n, we would go from a trigonal pyramid to a uh, tetragonal pyramid, and then to a pentagonal pyramid, and so forth. So now we could increase the number of um, well, corners and base of the pyramid <coughs> to infinite, and then we would arrive at the shape of a cone. Okay. So in this case, we have the so-called linear group C infinite V. So in this case, we have a principal axis that has infinite order, and we have an infinite number of vertical mirror planes that contain the principal axis. So this point group is characteristic for polar linear molecules. For instance, uh, carbon monoxide, HF, N2O, HCN, and other um, linear molecules that are polar. Okay, so an example for that, um, you see here illustrated the HCN molecules. So you see here the hydrogen, the carbon, and the nitrogen. The nitrogen is bonded to the carbon via a, a triple bond, and this hydrogen is attached um, to this carbon. In addition, we are carbon hydrogen. Um, single bond, so um, this molecule is, is linear and it's polar so that it belongs to the point group C infinite V. You see here the infinite axis going through the bonds of that molecule. And then you have an infinite number of work molecule indicated as uh, indicated here in light blue that contain the principal axis. Okay, um, let us stop at this point.